This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Europe, The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, and Islam by Douglas Murray in 2017. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or check out my website for downloads. Chapter 12, Learning to Live with It. The carnage in Nice was just the first of a set of attacks that occurred almost daily in the summer of 2016. The Monday after the Nice attack, a 17-year-old asylum seeker named Mohamed Riyad pulled out an axe and a knife on a train in Bavaria, shouting Allahu Akbar and started hacking at fellow passengers. After seriously injuring five people, he was shot dead by the police. It transpired that the attacker had sworn allegiance to ISIS, and it also transpired that although he claimed to be from Afghanistan when he applied for asylum in Germany, records of him speaking suggested that he was in fact from Pakistan. If France was bad at discussing these matters, Germany proved far worse than anywhere. In the public discussion that followed the train attack, Germany's Green Party MP Renat Kunast questioned why police on the train had killed the attacker rather than shooting to injure him. The following day, one Mohammed Bufarchuk shouted Allahu Akbar and stabbed a French woman and her three daughters near Montpellier in France, apparently for dressing immodestly. The perpetrator had been born in Morocco. And a few days later, the child of Iranian immigrants in Munich killed nine people in a shooting spree beginning with seven teenagers at McDonald's. His motives remain obscure. And then we have a couple more grisly examples, which we'll skip forward through. Some of these attacks were carried out by people who had arrived in Europe during a migrant wave of recent years. Other attacks were carried out by individuals who had been born in Europe. The search for easy answers was as elusive as ever. These people wishing to blame terrorism on the lack of integration strategies in Europe were at a loss to explain the sense in importing so many new arrivals to a continent so bad at integrating its earlier ones. Those who wanted to talk about the recent migrant wave were at a loss to explain why even people born and brought up in Europe could carry out such attacks. Those who looked to explain the motives away found themselves struck by the sheer range of the targets. Those who believed that the staff of the rambunctiously secularist and anti-theist magazine Charlie Hebdo had some sense, in some sense had it coming to them in January 2015, could not explain what a priest saying mass had done to deserve to be slain at his own altar 18 months later. A 46-year-old Parisian interviewed after the November 2015 Paris attacks inadvertently summed up the learning curve her society was on. In an unfortunate word of the use, uh, use of the word just, she said, quote, Every Parisian w has been touched by these attacks. Before it was just the Jews, the writers or the cartoonists, end quote. If this was all terrible for Europe's view of itself and its future, it still had worse to discover. The terrorist attacks may have presented the public with the clearest reason for growing concern. But other equally and in some ways even more basic worries emerged over something that was perhaps more unmentionable. Almost everybody could recognize a terrorist attack when it occurred, when it occurred even though they might quibble over the causes. But alongside the growing security concerns that everyone began to agree needed addressing, another subject arose that nobody wanted to discuss, and everyone was terrified of addressing. And that was throughout the 2000s, the question of sex attacks on local women by gangs of immigrants had been an open secret. It was something that nobody wanted to speak or hear about. There was something so base and so rank, however, in even mentioning it. Even to imply that dark-skinned men had a penchant for abusing Lighter colored women seem to be so clearly to originate from some odious racist text that it appeared impossibly, firstly, to even imagine that it might be happening, and secondly, that it might even be discussed. British officials were so terrified about even mentioning such crimes in the North that every single arm of the state failed to respond over the course of years. When the same phenomena occurred on the continent, precisely the same concerns and problems were encountered. Even to mention the fact that in 2015, most of the recent arrivals in Europe seemed to be young men was to court opprobrium. To question whether all these individuals might have brought modern views about women with them was an unmentionable, precisely as in Britain, because it seemed to speak to some base or racist smear. The fear of falling into the racial cliché or suffering accusations prevented authorities and the European public from admitting to a problem that had spread across the continent 
and even more refugees a country took in, the greater the problem became. And then we have a couple paragraphs of some quite in-depth stories of these perpetrations, which I'm going to skip through. Um, yeah. But the numbers are, are vast, unfortunately. Eventually, this unmentionable subject became so bad that in September of 2015, officials in Bavaria began to warn local parents to ensure that their daughters did not wear revealing clothing in public. Quote, revealing tops or blouses, short skirts or miniskirts could lead to cultural misunderstandings, end quote, one letter to locals warned. In some Bavarian towns, including Maring, police warned parents not to allow their children to go outside alone, and local women were advised not to walk to the railway station unaccompanied. On a daily basis from 2015 onwards, there were reports of rapes on German streets, in communal buildings, public baths, and many other locations. Similar events were reported in Austria, Sweden, and elsewhere, but everywhere the subject of rape itself remained underground, covered up by the authorities, and deemed by most of the European media not to be a respectable news story. Unusually, in December of 2015, the New York Times reported on the classes that Norway was offering migrants who volunteered to learn about how to treat women in a Western society. These lessons were aimed at countering Norway's increasing rape problem by explaining to refugees that, for instance, if a woman smiled at them or dressed in a way, that did not mean that she was inviting them. These lessons to people who, in the words of one of the organizers, had never before seen a miniskirt, but only a burqa, confused some of them. One 33-year-old asylum seeker explained, quote, Men have weaknesses, and when they see someone smiling, it is difficult to control. He continues, speaking of his own country of Eritrea, if someone wants a lady, he can just take her, and he will not be punished, end quote. And this clash of sexual cultures had been simmering ac across Europe for years, but it was an indelicate, noxious subject for the mainstream to discuss. Only on the last day of 2015 did it break out on such a large scale that it could no longer be ignored. But the events in Cologne on New Year's Eve 2015 leaked out slowly. To begin with, the mainstream media did not report the events, and only after seven day, several days, and thanks to the blogosphere, did the continent, let alone the rest of the world, learn what had gone on. On one of the busiest nights of the year, as the city was celebrating, crowds of up to 2,000 men sexually assaulted and robbed, something in the region of 1,200 women in the main square outside the central railway station and cathedral of Cologne, and in the adjoining streets. It tr soon transpired that similar attacks had occurred in other German cities, from Hamburg in the north all the way to Stuttgart in the south. In the days after the attacks, as the scale and seriousness of the events sunk in, the police in, in Cologne and elsewhere strenuously attempted to conceal the identities of the culprits. Only when photo and, vi and videographic evidence from the scenes were shared on social media and confirmed in the mass media did the police admit that all the suspects were of North African or Middle Eastern appearance. In Germany in 2016, as in Britain in the early 2000s, a fear of the consequences of identifying the racial origins of the assailants took priority over the police force's commitment to doing their job. It was all part of a pattern that, we, that would be ongoing and seemingly interminable. Throughout 2016, the spate of rapes and sexual assaults spread to every one of Germany's 16 federal states. There were attacks literally every day, with most of the perpetrators never found. According to the German Minister of Justice, Heiko Maas, just a tenth of rapes in Germany are reported, and of those that reach trial, only 8% result in a conviction. Moreover, several additional problems emerged from these cases, not least that there appeared to be a concerted official effort to suppress data about crimes, where the suspects might have been migrants. It was, as De Velt finally admitted, a Germany-wide phenomenon. Just as in Britain a decade earlier, it transpired that German anti-racism groups had been involved. In this case, they had pressured the German police to remove identifiers from all suspect appeals for risk of stigmatizing whole groups of people. There was also the curious problem, not confined to Germany, of some women and even girls who had been assaulted trying to conceal the identities of their attackers. One of the most striking cases involved a 24-year-old woman who was assaulted by three migrants in Mannheim in January 2016. She herself was half-Turkish and had claimed at the time of her attack that her assailants were German nationals. 
Only later did the woman, who was also a spokesperson for the German left-wing youth movement, admit that she had lied about the identities of her attackers because she did not want to help fuel aggressive racism. In an open letter to her attackers, she apologized to them and wrote, quote, I wanted an open Europe, a friendly one, one that I can gladly live in and in which we are both safe. I am sorry. For us both, I am incredibly sorry. You, you aren't safe here because we live in a racist society. I, I am not safe here because we live in a sexist society. But what truly makes me feel sorry are the circumstances by which the sexist and boundary-crossing acts that were inflicted upon me make it so that you are beset by increasing and more aggressive racist remarks. I promise you I will scream. I will not allow it that this continues happening. I will not stand idly by and watch as the racists and concerned citizens call you a problem. You are not a problem. You are not a problem at all. You are often a, you you most often are a wonderful human being who deserves to be free and safe like everyone else. End quote. Germany was not the only country where such things occurred. In the 2000 in the summer of 2015, a young female activist working with the No Borders movement at the Ventimiglia crossing point between Italy and France was again assaulted by a group of Sudanese migrants. Her fellow No Borders activists persuaded her to keep the attack quiet in order not to damage their cause. When the woman finally did admit to the attack, they accused of her of reporting her own rape out of spite. Through all of this in Germany, as in the rest of Europe, it was often left to local authorities to try to find answers to the challenges which had come their way. They not only had to find available facilities, but also to come up with suitable policies. A mayor in Tübingen addressed the problem of an upsurge of assaults of women and children in local swimming pools by appealing for more migrants to become swimming pool attendants. As he wrote on Facebook, quote, Our municipality has embraced a great prevention and integration measure. We have a Syrian lifeguard who can make it known in Arabic and with authority what behavior is allowed and what is not, end quote. The public also had to find answers to the problem that their politicians were presented with. And in the certain knowledge that even were the policy to suddenly change, the effect on society was irreversible. What, after all, can any government want, do once it realizes that its policies have, effect, have effects such as these? The German answer, as with the answers of governments across the continent for years, was to get on top of a specific part of the problem. Just as French governments had introduced the ban on headscarves, burkas, or bikinis, the German authorities focused on the narrow issue of counterterrorism. During the period before and after the migrant crisis, their intelligence agencies maintained an impressive surveillance capability against people believed to be involved in the most radical movements. Compared to the French or the Belgians, the ability of the Germans in this area was admired throughout Europe. But such, such success also kept the debate necessarily narrow. <clears throat> German politicians, as with counterterrorism practitioners, focused on exceptionally limited questions, such as so-called paths to radicalization that every country had discussed, but which became central to the German discussion. A bogus science grew up, while, while all the time policymakers missed the bigger question beneath, Questions that the general public had long been, long been asking themselves. For the public seemed to know what the officials could not admit, which was that radicalization originated with a particular community. And as long as that community grew, the radicalization would grow. There was, after all, a reason why the European country with the highest per capita Muslim community, France, had suffered the largest number of attacks by radicals, whereas a country like Slovakia, for example, had suffered no such problems. At such times, the gap between what the public can see and what the politicians can conceivably say, let alone do about it, became dangerously large. That was a powerful sentence. I'm going to read you again. At such times, the gap between what the public can see and what the politicians could conceivably say, let alone do about it, became dangerously large. An Ipsos poll published in July of 2016 surveyed public attitudes towards immigration. It revealed just how few people think that immigration has a good impact on their societies. To the question, would you say that immigration has generally had a positive or negative impact on your country? Extraordinarily low percentages of people in each country thought by then that immigration had had a positive effect. Britain had a comparatively positive, positive attitude, with 36% of people saying they thought immigration had a very or fairly positive impact. 
Meanwhile, only 24% of Swedes felt the same way and just about 18% of Germans. In Italy, France, and Belgium, only 10 to 11% of the population thought that immigration had made even a fairly positive impact on their societies, these countries in which the surge had occurred the most powerfully. Following such a migration surge, coming after decades of variations on the same theme, how could European governments expect to be listened to, even as they spoke with great force and determinations previously on those issues of immigration and integration? Aside from the fact that, for a government like Germany's, this would entail the repudiation of policies decided upon just months earlier, there is the problem that the rhetoric had long ago worn thin. It had been worn thin by politicians across Europe, from both the left and the right, by Michael Howard and Gordon Brown, by Michael Ricard and Nicolas Sarkozy. Europeans had spent decades witnessing the gap between rhetoric and reality, the inflated claims and the simultaneous implausibility of those claims. They had even heard some send-them-back rhetoric, ugly as it was, and realized it was no more true than any of the other claims. Back in 1992, there had been an upsurge of illegal migrant boat landings on the southern shores of Spain. It was government policy to return Moroccans who had entered Spain illegally, and deals with the comparatively friendly and helpful government of Morocco still held. But the government of Rabat refused to take back any non-Moroccans who had sailed from their shores. And although such illegals could be held in Spain for up to 40 days, they were then given their expulsion papers and expected to leave the country within a further 30 days. As in the years before and after, the vast majority stayed, expulsion papers or no. One reporter covering this in 1992 interviewed a 19-year-old from Algeria. Where would he be heading? He says, I have lots of family in France. And how would he get there? Across the mountains, of course. He had mailed his passport on ahead so that his relatives, or to his relatives, so it not, could not be confiscated on the way. Almost all the other people, also being temporarily detained by the Spanish authorities, were sub-Saharan Africans and all said that once they were released from detention would head north into Europe. Then as now, the Spanish and Moroccan authorities announced new deals, frameworks, and solutions. Then as now, the ability of many officials on all sides to turn a blind eye to the trafficking and a decision, once the migrants were in Europe, that it was easier to let them drift on up into the continent, made all such deals and solutions but little better than meaningless. The same story had played out itself across Europe. Even while he took immigration to country-changing levels, Tony Blair had sometimes wanted to look tough on immigration. In 2000, there were 30,000 failed applicants for asylum in the UK, a third of the 90,000 who had applied for asylum in 1999. In that year, only about 7,500 failed asylum seekers had been removed from the country. The target was decided to be impossible to, to achieve and too divisive, politically difficult, and financially costly to achieve. For parties of the right, fearful as they were of the attribution of base motives, it remained even harder for them to get a grip on the problem. As a stunt in, 2006, in 2013 under a conservative majority government, the Home Office organized a number of vans with advertising posters along the sides to drive around six London bur boroughs where many illegal immigrants lived. The posters read, quote, In the UK illegally, go home or face arrest, followed by a government helpline number, end quote. The posters immediately, obviously, became politically toxic. The Labour Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, described them as divisive and disgraceful. The campaign group Liberty not only branded the van's messages as racist, but also illegal. After some months, it was revealed that the pilot scheme had successfully persuaded only 11 people to leave the country voluntarily. The then Home Secretary, Theresa May, admitted the scheme had been a mistake and too blunt, and it was not repeated. Of course, the scheme had not been intended to genuinely persuade the up to one million illegal migrants in Britain to, rush, to return home, but to reassure the rest of the population that their government was trying to be tough. Subsequent efforts to arrest, <clears throat> subsequent efforts to arrest illegal migrant workers were met with fierce and forceful opposition on the streets by left-wing campaigners. That this was all a farce can be seen from the fact that Britain has only around 5,000 detention spaces available in the entire country, and that forced, remo and forced removals only ever reach around 4,000 a year. 
The, these comprise roughly equal thirds of prisoners, failed asylum seekers, and immigration offenders. Long before the height of the migration crisis, officials had already given up on the idea of deportation, even for most failed asylum seekers. So it was not surprising that, once the crisis was underway, even those in Europe without any legitimate asylum claim would expect to stay. As the implications of the crisis began to overwhelm them, in 2016 the governments of Germany and Sweden began to pretend that they had a system in place that would be able to process arrivals and applicants and work out who should stay and who should leave. Never mind that they had no reliable system for working out who had arrived, they did not even have success in dealing with those claims who had been rejected. Mohamed Dalil, who carried out Germany's first suicide bombing outside the wine bar in Ansbach in July of 2016, had registered as a refugee in Bulgaria and had been ordered to return there by the German authorities in 2014 and once again in 2016. As in Sweden, where left-wing groups attempted to disrupt the removal of any failed asylum seekers, a politician from the left-wing De Link party admitted afterwards that he had intervened, intervened on Dalil's side to prevent this removal from Germany back to Bulgaria. In August of 2016, two Belgian policewomen in Cherlio were attacked on the street by a machete-wielding man shouting Allahu Akbar. The attacker turned out to have ties to ISIS, and in the wake of the assault, the Belgian Secretary of State for Asylum, Migration, and Administrative Simplification, Theo Franken, revealed that the attacker had been in Belgium since 2012. He had been issued deportation orders twice, but no repatriation existing understands, but understanding exists between Belgium and Algeria, and no spaces existed in Belgium secure detention facilities. Such stories of people known to be involved in terrorist attacks are easy ones to identify, but the stories of the ordinary migrants who simply stayed and got forgotten about in the hundreds of thousands is the real story behind these headlines. In January of 2016, two politicians revealed the true scale of this disaster. In an interview on Dutch television, Frans Timmermans, vice president of the European Commission, admitted that the majority of people who had come to Europe in the previous years had not been asylum seekers, but economic migrants. Citing figures from the EU's Frontex border agency, Timmermans admitted that at least 60% of those who arrived in 2015 were in fact migrant or economic migrants, with no more right to be in Europe than anywhere else in the world. As for those from North African states such as Morocco and Tunisia, such individuals, Timmerman said, quote, are people you can assume have no reason to apply for refugee status, end quote. Then the Swedish interior minister, Anders Yigsman, admitted that the roughly of the roughly 163,000 people who had arrived in Sweden the year before, only around half had any legitimate claim to be in the country. Mr. Eegman talked about the number of planes that the Swedish government was going to need to charter and warned that it might take several years to remove those individuals. Of those immigrants into Sweden in 2015, who the government had determined should not be there, he said, quote, We are talking about 60,000 people, but the number could climb to 80,000, end quote. It is horrifying to think that a government can come to such a realization only after opening the doors after, for so long. The German government was eventually reduced to commissioning the private consulting firm McKinsey ugh, to try to analyze its own repatriation program. Perhaps it needed fresh eyes to review the mess it had created. Even what program there was tended to fail. When the government made an attempt to deport 300 failed Pakistani asylum seekers to their country of origin, Pakistan simply refused to take them, and so Germany took them back. At the as of the end of May 2016, Germany had over 220,000 people under deportation orders. Just 11,300 of these were deported to other countries, including their country of first entry, such as Bulgaria. Yet when the German interior minister, Thomas de Mazir, boasted in parliament that this is much more than in past years, he only revealed how paltry the efforts of previous years had been. For if the Timmermans Frontex figure was correct, and the German government estimates, estimates of its 2015 intake were correct, then this would mean that Germany ought to be preparing to deport around 750,000 people who arrived in 2015 alone. Nobody inside the bureaucracy of the German government was, or ever would be, prepared or willing to carry out such an exercise. 
all, any more than the Swedish government was truly going to deport 80,000 fake asylum seekers from their country from the year 2015 alone. Everyone in Sweden and Europe knew that they were not even going to attempt this. Mass deportations in Europe were not on the agenda in 2015 or 2016 any more than they were at any other time during the post-war period. What the European politicians could not admit is what every migrant crossing the Mediterranean knows, and what most members of the European public have wised up to, which is that once you are in Europe, you're there to stay. Moreover, Europe remains the world leader in not only allowing people to stay, but in assisting them to fight the state, even when they are there illegally. By 2016, Britain had still not even managed to deport a man wanted in India for two bombings in 1993. The Bolton greengrocer, Tagher Hanif, arrived in Britain illegally in 1996 and had managed to receive more than £200,000 in legal aid from British taxpayers to avoid repatriation. And nor does the continent's madness stop there. When Belgian investigators looked at the perpetrators of the numerous terrorist plots carried out by the Belgian nationals, they discovered that a great many of them had plotted their attacks while being supported by the state. Indeed, Salah Abdeslam, the lead surviving suspect of the November 2015 Paris attacks, had collected unemployment benefits to the tune of 19,000 euros in the period preceding the attacks. He had collected his last benefits only a week before, making European societies among the first in history to have paid the people to attack them. Of course, such cases are only the most high-profile ones. The people who become known are about because they engaged in terror. Of the hundreds of thousands of people who arrived in Italy in 2015, around half claimed asylum in the country. Around 30,000 expulsion orders were issued, but not even half were attempted or were attempted to be enforced. These are the ones Italy knows about. Nobody in Europe has any idea where the 50% of people who did not ask for asylum in Italy in 2015 are today. Once the borders began to close, the pressure began to build at all of them. At the Italian-Austrian border, people who were clearly not Italian were being kept out of Austria, against protocols, but as a standard of the new Europe. Others continued to try to evade French forces and get into France. As these two routes were blocked, the option of crossing the mountains over into Switzerland re-emerged. But otherwise, these bottlenecks continued, and continued to be Italy's problem. Greece, too, had become bunged up with arriving immigrants, where once the flow had landed and gone up unhindered, now from Bulgaria to all points north, governments were trying to reverse their policy. Yet, Greece and the other reception countries were the ones most stuck with the effects of those reversals. It was Greece that could not move the migrants northwards, and yet could not send them back home. And what did the woman who had the most culpability for this mess have to say about it? In, two th in September of 2015, German Chancellor Angela Merkel was receiving an honorary doctorate from the University of Bern in Switzerland. After a short speech, those present were invited to ask questions. A woman of about the Chancellor's own age politely asked, something, uh, asked about something Angela had said. A minute ago, the Chancellor had been talking about the responsibility that Europeans had towards the refugees, but what of the responsibility of Europeans to protect the well-being of other Europeans? The increase of the number of people from Islamic countries now coming into Europe was clearly a concern to many Europeans, the woman said. How would the Chancellor protect Europeans and European culture from this influx? Merkel cleared her throat by saying that because of the number of fighters from Europe who had gone to join groups like ISIS, Europeans could not say that all this had nothing to do with them. But this was not what her questioner had asked. But the Chancellor went on, Fear is a bad advisor in personal and social life. Then referring to her own earlier remarks about Islam being a part of Germany, she said, We had the debate if Islam is part of Germany. When you have four million Muslims in your country, I find one doesn't have to argue over whether this over this whether the Muslims are now a part of Germany and Islam isn't, or if Islam is also a part of Germany. End quote. It was what came next that was the most extraordinarily. The Chancellor continues, quote, Of course, we all have the responsibilities and freedoms to worship our own religions. And if I am missing something in all this, then it isn't that I am somehow reprimanding anyone for being faithful in their Muslim faith, but rather that we ought to be brave enough to say that we are Christians, be brave enough to say that we are entering a dialogue. 
but then please, on the basis of also having the traditions, occasionally go to a prayer service, be versed in the Bible a little, and perhaps also know how to explain a painting in the church. And if you were to ask for essays in Germany about what the Pentecost means, I'd say that the knowledge about the Christian Occident is not as great. And to then subsequently complain that Muslims know the Quran better, I find somewhat strange. Perhaps this debate can lead on occasion to us considering our own roots and gaining a little bit more knowledge about this. European history is so rich in dramatic and gruesome conflicts that we should be very careful to immediately complain if something bad happens somewhere else. We have to go against this, try and fight against this, but we have absolutely no grounds for arrogance, I must say. And I say this now as the German Chancellor. End quote. In the German media, Merkel was much praised for the courage and wisdom of this response. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.